and seeing if there's a specific intention you would like to connect to for the rest of your participation tonight. Maybe just the intention to be present. To be here now. Or if there's something else that's on your mind, letting it be known. And finally, before we sit together now in silence, inviting also anyone into the space that you would like to include in this circle of practice. Someone who perhaps would benefit from the practice of generosity. Someone whom you know is suffering. Someone who's just on your mind naming them to yourself. It could be a human being or an animal friend. It could be one individual or many, or maybe just a group of people, maybe people that you don't even know. You would like to invite those beings into this space, be included in this practice, benefit from our practice together, inviting them in. Now dropping any images, words, and just settling into this body sitting and this body breathing. Resting and receiving the moment. Being here now.
the mind has wandered off, thoughts of the past or the future, or sleepiness has shown up in the body. Gently inviting the mind to come back, relax, to be present. Receiving the moment to moment experience of your life. Coming back to this body and this breath and this moment.
Now, once again, connecting to the felt sense of the body, the body sitting, weight of the body, the support of the earth. The breath in the body, the wind element. The space around the body. And this space connecting all of us here tonight. This community of practice. And as you hear the sound of the bell, then opening your eyes if they've been closed and if you choose to, turning on your camera. So I'd invite you to look around, maybe look behind you and around you and out in the distance and move if you feel so inclined. You've been sitting still for a while. So as I mentioned um, earlier, um, Stacy last week talked about the paramis, uh, and I wanted to um, offer a few more reflections on that, and specifically the first parami, which is the, the parami of Donna or generosity, which is my personal favorite. So uh, the paramis, as you may know, are, they are said to be the qualities of the enlightened mind or the mind of a Buddha. And they're what the Buddha practiced for many, many lifetimes. I've forgotten the number, maybe you know, it's like something like 365 lifetimes. So if you're not really, um, if you don't feel you're proficient in all of them quite yet, you've got a lot more time to, <laughs> to practice. Um, yeah, and I see that um, Jessica uh, has put uh, a little something in the chat about the first parami, the parami of generosity, which we practice at Common Ground. So as a reminder, in this tradition, the Theravadan tradition, um, the, the practice of generosity is the first of 10 paramis. The number varies depending on what lineage you're in. Um, but they're all based on the principle of um, the wish for the welfare of others. So I'll list the others. I have to read them because I can never remember them all. Um, but the others are virtue, renunciation, wisdom, energy, patience, truthfulness, determination, loving kindness, and equanimity, equanimity, quite a list. We could spend lifetimes practicing any one of those, I think, or I could anyways. So it's said that generosity is listed first because it's thought that it's the quality that's available to all of us. So all of us know how to be generous. Ordinary people know how to be generous. Ordinary people can practice generosity. And it's also considered to be the easiest of the practices and the foundation of a spiritual life. And I'm guessing that if you look in almost any faith tradition, generosity would be there, either explicitly or implicitly. So I wanted to share a story. I like to tell stories because you might not remember a word I say, but 
you probably will remember um, the story that I tell. And um, so it's a story that really kind of helps us to connect to this quality of generosity in our own hearts. And it's a story that was told on National Public Radio a couple of days ago. So if you listen to NPR, as I do, you might have already heard this story. But it's the story of a man named Rafino Rodriguez, who lost his life uh, to COVID-19, helping tiny infants in the NICU. So I'll try to read this without weeping. I may weep, but that's OK. Uh, it's, quite a, it's quite a story. So this is a summary of, of a much longer story. If you want to hear it, um, actually in the voice of his son, uh, you, can, you can just look for it on, on the internet. Just you can Google Rafino Rodriguez, it'll come up. So this is the story. In Utah, more than 2,000 people have died from COVID-19. <clears throat> One of them was Mariano Rafino Rodriguez. He went by Rafino and was a beloved respiratory therapist working with the smallest humans in a neonatal intensive care unit. Mr. Rafino was a doctor born in Guatemala, but his medical license didn't transfer when he immigrated to the US in the 1980s. So he started over and in time became a respiratory therapist at Utah Valley Hospital NICU in Provo. He also worked as part of the local life flight team, transporting infants in critical need of care. Mr. Rafino's career was full of acts of generosity. His son tells the story of his designing tiny respirators to fit the baby's faces so that while they were on stay in the NICU. He said that his dad was planning to retire before the pandemic uh, but he felt called to stay and to help his co-workers. He was known for not only what he did for the babies, but also for the reassurance that he brought to the parents. He would get the parents who were fearing, for, he would get the parents who were fearing for their child's life to laugh. He would help them to relax. In fact, he had a talent for making everyone he came in contact with to feel happy and at ease. His smile was infectious and he would do outlandish things like put a map, mop on his head while dressed up in his PPE gear. I just kind of envision that. He had his first dose of the vaccine on December 17th and four days later tested positive for the virus. The night he died, dozens upon dozens of Rufino Rodriguez's friends, colleagues, and former patients stood outside the hospital. They held the lights on their phones up in the air, pointing to Rufino's room. Above them, a life flight helicopter shined its light too. Dr. Stephen Mitten was among them, and he told KSL TV in Utah that Rufino was, quote, one of those special people, he lit up the room. That was why all of us were out there with lights. We were sending that back to him. Rafino Rodriguez died in January in the hospital he worked in for more than 30 years. Surrounded by a son, daughter-in-law, and in the distance, his community. He was 65. So let's take oh, just a moment to notice what's in our hearts and minds. Take a few breaths. So I guess in a way I would like to dedicate this uh, practice tonight to Mr. Rufino. So I think people, uh, Mr. Rodriguez, excuse me, his name was, first name was Rufino. So I think people like Mr. Rodriguez uh, are the people that the Buddha was talking about when he thought about generosity. 
And even though generosity is said to be the most basic and easiest of the spiritual perfections, it isn't always so simple. As anyone who knows who's given something away, we can be left with a very different experience depending upon our original intent. So I don't know about you, but sometimes I've given away something and then thought, oh, rats. <laughs> I really like that. I don't know if you've ever done that, but I have. Sometimes we might give out of a sense of obligation or guilt. And the point is not to criticize ourselves for that, because we all do that, but just to be uh, attuned to our motivation, whatever it is, so that we can learn from our direct experience. We can feel what it feels like when we give out of obligation or guilt or whatever it was, we can feel the ouch of that. And again, it's not to make ourselves feel bad or to criticize ourselves, it's, it's as a learning experience. So as a spiritual practice, Donna or generosity is about learning from giving and also from holding back. What does it feel like to hold back? To see for ourselves what feels best to see the subtle attachments that cause us to hold back or to think only of ourselves and to know the release of letting go. Are we motivated for, by the wholesome desire to free our minds from the conditioned forces that bind us? Or are we motivated by something unwholesome, such as the desire for recognition or belief that we should be generous? So the next time that we're moved to generosity, we might pause and check out our motivation. Is our motivation to give aligned with our highest spiritual goal and likely to lead to freedom? Or is it tinged with greed, anger, and delusion and likely to lead to suffering? So again, there's not a right or wrong here. This is about being aware. And when we can connect to our motivation and feel ready to give with an open heart, even the smallest of act of generosity is worthwhile. So this is from the Anguttara Nikaya, or the numerical discourses of the Buddha. Even if a person throws the rinsings of a bowl or a cup into a village pool or pond thinking, may whatever animals live here feed on this, that would be a source of merit. So every day that we live, we, it offers us the chance of being the recipient or the giver of small yet significant gifts. So Rufino Rodriguez is putting a mop on his head to make other people laugh in the midst of the most excruciating suffering was an example of a small yet hugely significant gift. And perhaps you've given gifts like that yourself. Perhaps you've looked at a homeless person in the eyes and wished them well. Or you've smiled at a stranger. Or maybe you've been the recipient of a stranger's smile. These good wishes and connection to another are all acts of generosity. So while many of us may think of generosity mostly in terms of the benefits to the receiver, it actually goes both ways. And if, if you have participated in generosity, I'm sure that you've, you've noticed that. So this is again, the words of the Buddha. In this world, monks, there are three things of value for one who gives. What are these things? Before giving, the mind of the giver is happy. While giving, the mind of the giver is made peaceful. After having given, the mind of the giver is uplifted. And that's certainly been my experience. Just anticipating doing something generous feels good. We I mean, don't even have to do it, but just thinking about it. And then when you're actually doing it, it feels good. And afterwards, it feels good. So it's like triple the, the joy. And this is also the Buddha. This is from the Siha Sutta. One who is generous is dear and charming to people at large. Furthermore, good people, people of integrity, admire one who is generous. 
Furthermore, the fine reputation of one who is generous, a master of giving, is spread far and wide. Furthermore, when one is generous, approaches any assembly of people, noble warriors, Brahmins, householders, or contemplatives, he or she or they does so confidently and without embarrassment. Furthermore, at the breakup of the body after death, one who is generous reappears in a good destination, the heavenly world. So I think this most certainly is Mr. Rafino's, Mr. Rodriguez's, Rafino Rodriguez's destination. So true generosity is what the Buddha was talking about when he said that all of his teachings could be summarized as, quote, nothing whatsoever is to be clung to as I or mine. Nothing whatsoever is to be clung to as I or mine. Or as a teacher at Spirit Rock once said on retreat, in this practice, we are giving back to nature that which is nature's. As parents, as children, as friends, as co-workers, as human beings, we are called to give back to nature, to life, that which was never really ours in the first place. To be grateful for the brief moment in which, the time in which we shared a life with others, and to give what we can for the welfare of all beings. And this is the territory of generosity of the quivering heart, staying connected to our deepest intention for freedom and the freedom of those that we love. So those are my thoughts, at least tonight on generosity. And, um, and I would invite you to take whatever is a benefit to you and to leave behind what isn't. Um, and I'm gonna pause there for a moment um, and just ask if there are any reflections or comments, any disagreements, any, anything you'd like to offer about what I said or didn't say on the topic of generosity. What's been your experience of generosity? So the practice I wanted to invite us to participate in is actually the practice of reflecting on our own generosity. And um, if you choose to sharing it uh, here tonight. And this is hard because I don't know if you're like me, you might've been brought up in a household where you weren't supposed to do stuff like that, right? That was considered tooting your own horn or whatever expression might have existed in your household. We didn't talk about our own goodness, right? We mostly talked about what was wrong. And yet the Buddha taught and others say that if we can actually connect to and name the ways in which we're generous and the other ways that we uh, live by our high, highest standards, that actually strengthens our tendency to do that in the future. So we're, we're strengthening our wholesomeness. And we're also gladdening the hearts of others by, uh, by naming it. You know, that's mudita, being able to hear what others are doing. And that makes us happy. So I'm going to lead us through a reflection, if you're game, um, just to reflect on the ways in which we've been generous. And, uh, and then I'm going to open it up and see if anybody would be willing to, I mean, this, these do not have to be big things, right? We could have just walked the dog when we didn't feel like it or, or did the dishes or whatever we did. Or as Kevin shared, um, you know, we did something friendly on Zoom or Sally's talking about her taking care of her friend who's dying, which is a pretty, pretty big act of generosity, even if the motives sometimes can get a little confusing. These are, we need to, we need to celebrate our generosity. So if you'd be willing to just take a moment, if you want to close your eyes, you can do that or just sit quietly. 
And just take a moment to reflect on the ways that you have practiced generosity, big and small. So in recent history, it doesn't even have to be recent history. Just allowing whatever comes to mind to be known. Again, maybe it was helping with the dishes or volunteering at a food shelf or calling a friend who you suspected might need a call. There's generosity here tonight already with people sharing their stories with Jessica helping out with the Zoom call. And right here now, just in the last hour that we've been together, there's been generosity. So taking a moment and, you know, when those messages come up like, oh, well, that wasn't really generous, just noticing that and letting it go and just taking a moment to be silent and reflect on your own generosity. Now taking a moment to reflect on the ways that others have shown generosity to you. And if you're like most human beings, this will be easier. You won't have as many self-critical thoughts or thoughts about how you shouldn't be thinking this. So just reflecting on ways that others have been generous to you through words or deeds or in more subtle ways. Reflecting on acts of generosity that you have received. Again, big or small, someone held a door for you, put on a mask when you were in their vicinity, called you up, sent you an email, smiled at you on Zoom. Whatever comes to mind, what generosity have you received? And then opening your eyes if they've been closed. So I'm going to start with the with the easier one, and I'm going to start with ways that we have received generosity. So again, the more we reflect on this, the the uh, ingrained is not the word I want, but the more it's available to us. We know what generosity feels like to have received it, and we know what it feels like to give it. So I'm going to invite you, if you're willing, or if you don't want to speak, you don't have to speak. You could actually put it in the chat, too. If you want to just mention, it can, you don't have to tell a long story, uh, acts of generosity that you've received that came to mind. What came to your mind? Well, I'll tell a story. I got an email from my daughter-in-law uh, telling me how much they enjoyed coming to visit us and how much my granddaughter, who just turned four, enjoys being in our house. And that was incredibly um, uh, important to me, because I, I, I always wonder about, you know, am I doing things right or whatever. Uh, so, uh, and, how I, and how I compare with the other grandparents. So my granddaughter has four sets of grandparents. <laughs> And my comparing mind is like, am I measuring up? So that was a very generous, unsolicited thing for her to say. And it had just a tremendous effect on, on me. Anybody else? I, I wanted to say to Brian, I, I appreciate what, what you said about thinking that, oh, I'm not, well, for me, it's like, I'm not doing enough. I should be out, you know, solving climate change, you know, and if I'm doing anything short of that, it's not enough. And so, so, you know, you teach what you need. So I've, I've been working on this, like trying to recognize that I, you know, that the small things count too. And in fact, when I reflect on my days and what's what's been meaningful to me, it's often 
the smaller things that I remember, the person that smiled at me at the store, uh, Jessica showing up to help. You know, these are the things that, that I hold in my heart. Not that the others aren't important, but so, uh, yeah, it just, it helps to uh, put things in perspective, I, I guess, because the challenges that we're facing now are so great that it's, um, uh, that it can get confusing, I guess. It feels so urgent, everything feels so urgent, and yet the little things are what sustain us, for me anyways. Anyone else wanna add anything about generosity that they've received? Okay, so now we're gonna go to the hard one, which is to share ways that we've been generous. And maybe I'm gonna need a big silence here, but um, when, when we reflected on our own generosity, and again, this is, does not have to be big. Uh, what are some of the ways that you have practiced generosity? And oftentimes it's unintentional. There, there are things that just spontaneously arise. And, and when we name these things and we hear them, that, that's, a, that's a, an act of generosity because it makes the rest of us feel good to hear it. So you might just be aware of, of of your re internal response, just receiving these stories. Uh, it's mudita, taking joy in other people's joy, generosity. So does anybody want to be brave and name ways that we they've been generous lately or long ago? I guess I'll follow on what Brian shared that um, think something that I've tried to practice more recently is making eye contact with people who are providing a service to me, asking them how they are, you know, and then wishing them a good day at the end. I mean, it, 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 I was going here I was going to minimize. I'm not going to minimize. I, it's, um, I think it's important. And, and I actually can sense that it, it has a, a positive effect on the people that I'm interacting with. Uh, so I'm just noticing that, like, okay, that wasn't much. Don't talk about it. <laughs> Thank you for receiving it. <laughs> Anyone else? So I thank you for your generosity in sharing. And I would invite you to, to make it a regular part of your practice. You know, I talk about practicing gratitude and thinking at the end of the day about the things that you received. But... And it, it can, you can be, think of this as part of a, a gratitude practice, but you really spend some time celebrating not only the generosity that you've received, but the generosity that you've offered. As again, that will make it more likely that you will be generous in the future. So I wanted to offer a poem, um, and then we can dedicate to merit. And I, unless there's anything else on someone's mind, then I think that we'll call it, what do they say? We'll call it a wrap. Is that what the young people say? <laughs> so this is a poem by uh, Elaine Sutton called After a Sleepless Night. After a sleepless night worrying about the world, I stand in the whispering grass, grass, watching the mountains crouch under their burden of sky. The morning sun glides above the peaks and the field is suddenly flooded with turquoise light. A flock of red wings rise. They turn together like a page of poetry. I read between the lines, realize I am lonely and afraid. I worry about the wars, the weather, the end of our beautiful broken world. I see the way we can harden our hearts when fear is what moves us. Now the marsh hawk cruises the yellow reeds. She dives swiftly and some soft furred creatures life is over. For each of us hauling our basket of dreams, there's only one breath, one breath that divides this world and the next. What is there to do then but give thanks? 
offer praise and gratitude for the sweetness we're allotted, fling open our burning hearts and help each other. So we have helped each other tonight by showing up for this practice and sharing what's in our hearts. And I would like to recognize that and uh, dedicate that to the, to the welfare of all beings. So let's take a moment to just settle once again into our, our bodies. So again, just connecting to the felt sense of the body and the breath. And connecting to any goodness that may have been generated tonight in our own hearts and in this group. Realizing that our practice, our practice together is not only for our well-being, but for the well-being of all beings everywhere. Two-legged beings and four-legged beings, beings with eight legs and more legs, beings that fly, beings that swim, being seen and unseen. May all beings everywhere be free from suffering. May all beings everywhere know the gift of generosity. May all beings everywhere know peace. So it was a pleasure being with you. Thank you all for coming tonight and sharing your wisdom with me and others. And uh, go forward and be generous. You've got it. Thank you. And thank you again, Jessica.